investors who want both or have a hybrid strategies of a mix of both strategies. So it's all there. So it's just uh, what the investor prefers and what the timing of those asset classes are. So based on those, I think uh, what we've done well in percent. So we're the fastest growing AMC, um, primarily because I think we were IDE positioned in investments in equity and fixed income. So I think the presentation we have today is yeah, on yeah. Pakistan so, 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 and yeah. Let me also just take you through as to how I think we will uh, take you through the presentation. Done. Uh, second component is with regards to Pakistan economy, and then the third component, of course, which will be the center of everyone's interest, is will be the equities. Uh, of course, what we're doing is we have a one-hour slot, so we'll have 30 minutes as to what we think of the market, some of the key variables that I think will interest everyone, and uh, and our top convictions. Uh, subsequent, we'll leave about 30 minutes open for Q&A. Uh, whoever has any questions, any any views, uh, whatever they would want to discuss, will be open for any Q&A. So I think that's ideally how we would want to take this forward. Uh, with that, I think uh, if we can. So I don't know. You can you share the presentation so that we can get started with it? Yeah. So, uh, why don't you start with the economic uh, uh, economic portion, and then as we go along, we I will intercede and we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, so we have gone through the section about about us, uh, about Kuldun, myself, and so I'll just give a small background. Uh, we, when the Kuldun joined the company, we started off the races completely, and we've touched a new high. We touched 20 billion in February. As of today, we are standing at 27 billion AUMs. Uh, our rating has been upgraded to AM2, which is considered very good quality management in Pakistan, right? So it's a significant notch up for us. And if you just give you a small background, so our AUMs grew by 196% in this 10 months. Uh, it's the fastest growing AMC in Pakistan. We have 17 funds now. now. Uh, we launched three new funds this year. And we offer a mix of money market, income, equity, capital protected. So all those options are there. Uh, if anybody will have questions on what mutual funds are or what type of mutual funds to invest in, we'll take Q&A at the end of the session. This is, a a, yeah, this is a graph that reflects how our AUM have grown over the last few months. I, 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 I must say we're gonna beat a bit of our own trumpet, uh, considering I think we have produced somewhat unprecedented results so this is uh, us in a nutshell, and we have grown quite significantly. Um, our, our desire, of course, is by the end of the year, we would want to be around 40 billion, and we are quite confident that despite COVID, this is something that we can achieve. Uh, if you could go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, so one question, what are AUMs? AUMs are assets under management. It's essentially how much money we manage. So that's the key benchmark of uh, uh, AMC's power in terms of how many Assets they manage. So like, you know, Templeton's and these guys, they manage in the billions of dollars. So something similar, that's what we do here. So coming to the economic part and the way this presentation is made that it is made specifically for expats. Because I thought I would share the variables that are most critical to anybody investing in Pakistan sitting from the States, right? So the idea is that it'll try to give you a, a brief what is happening in Pakistan, especially from a foreign investor's perspective. So going straight to the presentation, inflation was our biggest concern for the past few years when it was in the double digits, state bank was increasing interest rates just to manage inflation rate, right? So it was all going out of hand. So we didn't want to have, you know, a, a hyperinflation era. So the rates were increased more than required. And finally, about four or five months ago, the state bank reigned in that inflation and it has started bringing it down. So from April onwards, it's come into single digits. We expect, or state bank ex expects that it will range between seven to 9% for the next year. So in terms of Pakistan, I think seven to 9% is a very good 
long term median inflation number uh, this is yeah. where pakistan is in a key zone to grow its gdp andar andar food inflation oil prices all of those commodity declines have helped us so those are a significant positives now what this has allowed pakistan the central bank to do is because the rates have come down they have managed to cut interest rates back from 13% which was standing about 4 months ago down to 8% now uh, this is because we want real interest rates to stand at zero which is the average of what emerging markets interest rates are so at 8% is what we are earning for foreigners and anybody investing in the debt free markets or uh, here what happens is that when the rate comes to 8% the pitch for equities or the the allure that equities offer increases here so the idea is now equity and fixed income are both poised for a good race previously last year i would say fixed income was the asset class of choice now with the rates coming down in the single digits equities are again back in the limelight so just a small graphical representation of what we are saying the blue line is the inflation of pakistan so inflation touched 14% sometime about 6 7 months ago and since then has been on a downward trending and the red line was our discount rate or the policy benchmark rate so right now we are at 8% and the band that the state bank sees is between 9 to 7% but inflation going forward is expected to come to 7 and then 5 and gradually keep on falling so what this allows the state bank is further cuts down the road maybe in june or maybe in july actually we see another rate cut possibly possibly i say possibly because uh, we have no idea where oil prices will end up Uh, we have no idea what kind of budget the government might present because there are so many concerns for the covid situation where we might need to raise some taxes so we have no idea right now so it is there is an outlook for a rate cut but can't be for certain yeah, i think it's important to understand uh, a bit of the background as to what we're coming out of so i mean just before the covid hit uh, we had just barely reined in on inflation and we were giving sign of softening of the inflation and uh, there was some level of there were uh, I mean, if you remember last year i think the biggest concern for bulk of 2019 was external imbalances so i think the whole of 2019 was spent trying to address external imbalances which were finally beginning to show some sign of stability uh, of economy and 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 uh, and and suddenly the situation which was a central stage of 2019 has completely gone to back burner and uh, the economic resuscitation and avoiding systemic issues have taken center stage so of course this these interest rate cuts that we witnessed over the last few months is a is a response to this sudden economic shock which has suspended the entire economy so and and, and, and i think in the last few meetings uh, within my company what we look at is uh, the economic beel within 2019 was running at an excessive pace which created a lot of inf inflationary pressure and also exerted a lot of external imbalances uh, to smoothen it out we to to reduce the pace of the economic wheel there was a lot of interest rate lifting up which led to finally achieving a pace of the economic wheel which could handle the economic imbalances which could be funded both in the form of funding in these imbalances also bringing the economy to a more full employment level now suddenly we enter into the stage where we were this exogenous shock in the form of uh, of covid now with this suspension the economic wheel which we were already trying to break has broken so hard that there has a complete drain of confidence and there's an economic suspension now the exact reverse of what has happened in 2019 is into effect so right now there's a lot of effort both in the form of uh, you know economic uh, monetary stimulus and non monetary stimulus to make this economic engine to start to perform again so we what 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 uh, what what i'm trying to say is that this is a very difficult balance because the amount of shocks that have been applied on the economy 
all of a sudden are quite significant. So what we are seeing is the central bank is looking at a few critical variables and they're trying to balance out the mix so that the economic engine starts to function again. So which, uh, which is what Ayub is uh, trying to allude is that we will be looking at a number of variables that will determine whether or not there'll be further additional monetary stimulus or there will be uh, uh, there be uh, uh, there be monetary controls. It all depends on three variables. So what will happen? And right now, the first three months have been somewhat masked. We had ease in uh, the first three months. We had uh, uh, we have uh, we had a number of events which has somewhat camouflaged the data that is coming out, both on the remittance side and also on the fiscal side. So now when the budget will come out, we will actually have a much clearer outlook of the economic capacities of the leadership to see what it can do with it. So I think the next few weeks will really lay out the definition of the path of 2020. So that's frankly how I think these would be the key variables. And I, I, I like, uh, sorry, you, I've, I've interceded you, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you complete your uh, uh, your economic uh, layout. I think, yeah, the biggest variable for overseas investors is is uh, PKR, right? So the you invest dollars and you are investing in a rupee asset. So obviously the biggest risk to you is if the rupee depreciates further and the external accounts is the answer to that equation, right? So how strong our external accounts are determines how strong our exchange rate will be. So be, faced with this COVID situation, so what we have seen is that our exports, which is primarily textiles, they'll decline by about 20 to 30% YNY, while our imports will also see a similar reduction. Primarily, this is going to be energy, oil, and lower prices of commodities that we import. Similarly, our other export that we have is remittances. And the issue is that 54% of our remittances come from the GCC region which is hit hard because of low oil prices. So we can see a potential 20 to 30% drop in remittances, which would, again, the offsetting factor here is that our services deficit, uh, lower overseas travel, less Hajj or less Umrah this year, uh, because we spent a lot of dollars buying tickets, traveling for Hajj, a lot of summer travels, a lot of people travel in the summers, so that's not going to happen this year round. So from all of these angles, what we feel that somehow on a net basis, all the impact of the five variables should keep the current account stable while the market is trying to going to price it on a monthly basis based on any data that comes out, right? So imports, imports and exports data come one day, remittance comes the other day. So on every data point release, the market or the PKR movement is determined. Right now, we see a fairly uh, a stable outlook because all of these factors net each other out. But again, it's a wait and see. You have to keep on following what's happening with the economics. Yeah, and and and, and I think one of the key variable within the external side will be oil. So depending on oil, oil performance, that will affect uh, affect how our economy will uh, respond. Uh, we also, I think, I, I think it's an important point to highlight. There has been a lot of fiscal stimulus that has come through over the last couple of months. So any reversal, any confidence in the economy will spark uh, uh, both the inflationary side and also the external side. So the, the moment the economy starts to perform, we will go back to a lot of our, uh, you know, our, our, our external imbalances, challenges will start to reemerge. So that's something one has to keep a very close eye on. Uh, one slight variable that I wanted to show you, maybe because I think I believe most of the audience is from the states. So, just to give an idea of how much uh, the importance is growing of remittances, especially from the US. So, back in 2005, remittances used to be about 25% uh, from the states, but uh, as, as an absolute amount, about $100 million a month only. Gradually, since 2016, in October 2016, the percentage has again increased to about 20% of our remittances come from the states and the dollar number is now almost $350 million a month. So we feel that while GCC might go down, it is the Western world, which is UK and the US, which is primarily white collar jobs that will support uh, declining remittances from blue collar jobs in GCC markets. 
that's one element of positivity we are seeing from the western side but it's a data point that we will have to very closely view we i mean the verdict as far as this data is concerned is still not clear yeah uh, well we touched 350 for the last few months let's see if it goes up or uh, down because the same situation in the US applies. So I think this is probably the most important chart for any investor from the states. So the red line is the PKR to the dollar exchange rate. Uh, used to be still at six in 60 rupees to a dollar in, in the 2000, early 2000s. And it has gradually increased to about 161, 163 now. Now, this is the PKR. The white line is what actually shows is the real value of the rupee versus our import and export partners. So REAR is how we measure it. So what happened is that REAR used to be stable between 105 on the top side and 94 on the bottom side. Uh, but in the last government, uh, because we kept the rupee stable at uh, 110 rupees here, our real kept increasing because we were constantly importing from the world and exporting less. So our competitiveness compared to the world was decreasing. So our real touched 125. And to correct this, to correct this real is when our rupee was let go off from 110 rupees and now stands at 161. And our real is at back at 99. So I think what is here is happening is that that our currency based on this metric is fairly valued right now. We might see a spike to 165 and a same return back to 160. So what we don't, what we don't see is a massive spike to 180, 190, given the current data that we have. Obviously, if our export numbers continue to drop uh, because, of the uh, because of the current situation, uh, then we might, this data will change, keep on changing. But right now, 160 to 165 looks a fairly stable value of the rupee. And the biggest story for anybody investing in Pakistan, obviously, is uh, Pakistan is a very domestic demand driven economy. It's a, it's consumption based. Uh, it's the sixth largest population, 200 million plus. And the GDP, 82% of the GDP comes from consumption, uh, which is why we see a lot of uh, foreign MNCs coming to Pakistan, setting up shop to sell to the local consumption population. And we saw uh, Hyundai, Kia, all these auto companies come in also for that local potential, uh, because it is the potential is so much there that all these companies want to set up a factory here and then start selling locally. So the demand is there. And that's what makes us different from our, our regional players where they depend on export and imports or mostly on exports here. Because whatever happens worldwide, our domestic demand is the first thing that can recover and recover the GDP. So we don't really need foreign uh, imports or exports to really pick up or decrease. It's our domestic demand that will drive the GDP. If you look at from a, our CPI or the food basket, 35% of our food basket is just food, uh, which is primarily local grown. So most of the household spending is on food. The next is the housing and utilities. So both of these, almost 60% of our CPI basket is controlled by local factors. And once the domestic lockdown eases, the economy can start recover, recovering, even if there is not that same kind of recovery on the global trade level right we and i mean what i mean to say is that even if global trade does not recover to pre covid levels our gdp might recover faster so it's more resilient compared to another country where it's completely dependent on global trade so that was our uh, the presentation on our economy in a nutshell i think what everybody wanted to know was what's happening with Corona and know how the stock market is. Just to give you a brief slide on the situation, I don't think uh, the cases in Pakistan have peaked yet. Uh, we are still increasing at about 3,000 cases a day and we'll probably peak sometime end June or early July. 
uh, we still not haven't flattened the curve yet. And if you look at the graph I've shared with you, India, Bangladesh are at a similar trend. They're also trending upwards, similarly like us. Um, Brazil is doing the same, and but at a higher, much higher plateau level. So Brazil is at a very high level, while Pakistan, India are just, you know, Pakistan is doing 3,000 cases a day, India is doing about 5,000 cases a day. But relative right. to our population, our death rates are somewhat contained. Uh, however, I think in the next 30 days, particularly right after Eid, uh, I think our social interaction and our social distancing has somewhat crumbled. Uh, I suspect that over the next 10, 15 days, uh, this data may just take a sharp turn. Uh, however, the way I see it, I think there'll be a sharp spike and then hopefully there'll be a sharp plateau as well. Uh, uh, but I think one has to brace themselves for some unexpected, perhaps ugly data coming out over the next 10, 15 days. And uh, that may create opportunities in terms of valuation. So that's how, frankly, what we're seeing is unfortunate, but this is our expectations over the next 15 days. Coming on to the index itself and how we see it. So I, I think I wanted to start off with on what has happened previously. So, you know, Pakistan since 2014 has actually seen a lot of foreign selling. And for the last, out of the last six years, five years have been net, major net sales. So foreigners have left Pakistan in the last five years, again, because of deteriorating security situation, which has now improved, everything has now improved yet the foreigners were going out of the picture here. So if you see as a, our holding as a percentage of foreigners, they used to hold something close to about $9 billion worth of equities in Pakistan. And that number is now down to about $2 billion. So what has happened is that the element of foreign selling used to have a bigger impact in Pakistan. So when we say, oh, Gora Kharid Raya, Gora Bech Raya, the multiplier in the market sentiment used to be more than the, the value traded by the foreigner. But that in the last two years has dwindled. And now again, it's the locals who have picked up the slack and it's now the locals who are driving the market. Again, any stimulus from the foreigners that might come will be a further bonus here. But I don't see much more selling to come anymore. They've almost sold everything that they have in Pakistan. Now anything that will come in will be a bonus. So that will once again drive sentiment on the positive side. Yeah, but, 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 but to be honest, to be fair, I think this, this, this sell off and, and I think someone just raised a question. EM is emerging markets and FM are uh, frontier markets. So frankly, uh, as far as uh, this, so, so if you see that the, the trend of foreign sale had somewhat reversed in 2019. So 2020 is a bit of an anomaly of a trend that was just setting in. But now we're in an environment where there is a global risk of situation. So frankly, if you look at global financial institutions, there is a general tendency of taking risk off their balance sheet. So it is regardless if the country is cheap, expensive, whatever it is, the foreign large institutions are just exiting from any country that is perceived to be riskier. Pakistan falls into that category. So there is an exodus of even at six times earnings, foreigners are still exiting the market. And, uh, but, but that doesn't truly reflect the underlying economic conditions or the fundamentals that, are, that, they, that the country represents. Um, so FM stands for frontier markets and EM stands for emerging markets. So Pakistan is uh, in cat categorized in both, but uh, we are primarily in the emerging market right now. The other interesting statistic, uh, this will appeal to you, all of you, is the overseas Pakistani uh, is classified in Pakistan as anybody who holds NICOP and enters the Pakistani market to invest in through the SACRA account, which is the special bank account the state bank allows for anybody to invest in Pakistan through. So the activity that we have seen recently from overseas Pakistanis has increased. And uh, gross volumes have always been $8 million daily from these expats. And I think I expect this to rise further also after the rupee depreciation to 160 rupees. I think more and more money will be coming from overseas expats into the Pakistani stock market. 
Yes, it's a simple fact. I think uh, Pakistanis have a greater understanding of the market, uh, considering that the return of savings in the developed world is shrinking and shrinking significantly. It's almost zero or sub-zero for that matter. Uh, a lot of that is rechannelizing into markets and people are taking longer term views in terms of when the economic cycle, global economic cycles will start to resuscitate. There's a greater chance of an upside. Uh, in a country that is trading at six times earnings versus a country that is still trading at near its all-time high. So I think from that vantage point, I think there is a trade-off where only, like I said, the developed institutions are exiting simply because of their, because they're having a lot of redemption pressures and there is a, any fund that is perceived to be carrying risk, which includes countries like Pakistan, they're having redemption pressures, which is why they're offloading it from their balance sheet. Whereas individuals who don't have to reflect, who, who don't have to represent their books to any uh, any uh, investors, are taking much bigger position. And frankly, that's what the data is now reflecting. Okay. Uh, so this, in terms of so so the important part, and so so the key caveat for this is going forward. It is this component that will become a more significant participant in terms of price discovery within Pakistan. So soon you will see over the next few months that people will start to talk about this data more as opposed to what we've seen over the last five, 10 years. Okay, uh, so for who don't understand this, uh, PB means price to book. It's essentially what price you're paying for the book value or the, the, the cost of the asset. So if you're buying a house for a hundred rupees and the value of the house is hundred, so price to book is one. But if you're buying it at double the price, it's 2x then. So similarly, Pakistan on average used to trade at 1.6 times price to book values. So the stock market, uh, anything that you buy, you usually bought at 1.6 times the book value of the company. This uh, peaked at two times in 2017 when we went into the MSCI emerging markets. And right now, the econ the market is at 0.9 which is under book value so actually what you're buying the companies today in the stock market is actually you're buying more for the company than what the actual cash worth is so uh, i think it's steel yeah i will further add to it i think this chart is up till 2011 but i think a key point to compare is we're trading at 0.9 point it went as low as 0.8 times book values so when we had a 2007 crisis, when the market was frozen and it went and it traded and when, when it, it resumed, it made its all time low. Even then it traded at 0.98 times book value. This time around, it has already broken that level for a considerable period and has gone as low as 0.87, I think 0.81 or 0.8 times book value. So the opportunity that is offering is even greater than the last emerging market crisis. And uh, the other way that we look at markets is based on the earnings potential. So uh, that's our price to earnings. So PE is what most market participants look at when they're investing in any market. So compared to like India's trading at a PE of 15 to 20 X S and P uh, was trading at about 18 to 20 X is, is now trading at apparently 25, 30 X because earnings of most companies have, come drastically down while the prices have recovered to pre covid levels so based on price to earnings they're trading at all time high in pakistan uh, the same metric is down to six times its earnings so whatever company you are buying you are actually buying it at just six times the earning versus if you're buying the same company in the states you're buying it at 20 25 times its earnings so despite a 25% rally in Pakistan in the last two months, the market is still cheap compared to even 2010 when it was trading at 6x or slightly below 6x. Uh, this is a slightly complicated chart, but I'll try to guy, uh, make you guys go through it. So what happens is that you see all kinds of uh, variables move in conjunction with together. So when the discount rate goes down, so do the yields on the bonds go down and same time the equity market picks up. 
So what has happened is that discount rate and the three-year Pakistani investment bond, which is issued by the government, have a very strong inverse relationship with the earnings potential of the KSC. So whenever the discount rate is drastically cut, which is the case now, and the same is the case with the, uh, the, the bond, the bond yields have collapsed from double digits to 7% now. Uh, in the States, bond yields have collapsed again from like 2% to 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 now. So whenever yields collapse like this, equity gets a stimulus. So what we see is that the discount rate has come down, the yields have come down, but the earnings price to earnings ratio has not caught up yet. So there's an arbitrage opportunity here where we expect the price to earnings to really go into like 8x or 9x in Pakistan in the next uh, one year or so. So there's a great opportunity here. So, so, so just to coming, going back to our economic argument that we had at the beginning. So what we feel is typically in business cycles, whenever the interest rate starts to collapse, equity starts to perform. And this has been the case if you look at 2010 till 13, when the interest rate started cutting, we saw a rally in the market again in 2004, 2005, interest rate went as low as 2%. There was a massive rally in the equities market. However, this time around, we're not seeing this rally simply because of the systemic issues that we see. Of course, this rally, which is pending, will come with a lag. So like I said, once the economic wheel will start to perform, the confidence will start to kick in and that will reinvigorate in investor confidence that will boost up this, earning, this price earning multiple. So, of course, the real question is when will the confidence return? Of course, this is dependent on when we feel that there is some sort of solution on, uh, on uh, COVID or perhaps uh, there is a, a, the worst or the, the peak of COVID is behind us. This could, be a, this could be a matter of months, it could be a matter of six months. Frankly, that's hard to predict, but whenever that will happen. Now, if we have patient capital, the value is already there. And, 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 and frankly, from a, just, a, just from an investment point of view, I think one can distribute his, their investment over a wide period. Chances are you will have a significant return once the confidence kicks in. It could be three months, it could be six months, it could be 12 months. But looking at the risk return, risk reward ratio, you're now in a relatively sweet spot within this mix. And I think the next two to three months, you will be at the heart of this mix. Okay. Um, another slide that I thought I would put in here is to just give you an idea of uh, a comparison between S&P with the KSC 100. Uh, because I know you guys follow the S&P and the NASDAQ a lot. So you can actually see that since 2009, both the S&P and the Karachi Stock Exchange market were actually going together in tandem. Um, so they were both following the same track till 2016. Here, because Pakistan was going as an emerging market, so our market really shot up while S&P continued on its normal path here. But after the inclusion into the emerging markets, uh, political instability, change in government, oil prices, a lot of factors that came into play. And the PSX has just been on a, on a downtrend throughout this whole period, while S&P is still trending upwards. Now what we feel is that the, the correlation is somewhat coming back in together. So both the markets dropped together and now both are recovering as fast as possible. Uh, S&P has recovered quite a bit. The NASDAQ did a V-shaped recovery almost in terms of prices. So we feel that because of valuation gap, uh, the stock exchange is also cheap here. So we might see a big recovery coming this way, the index also. I think a lot of this would be dependent on what kind of budget we, uh, we get in the next 10 days. Yeah, the other reason I think why the NASDAQ and S&P were recovering much more quicker than the PSX is because infotech or tech stocks, healthcare, these are the, some of the stocks that they performed really well in this environment because of digitization and, and health fears. So if you look at the S&P breakup, infotech almost makes up 26% of the index and healthcare makes 15% of the index. In Pakistan, 
the biggest sector that we have is consumer staples. So this is most of our MNCs, uh, a lot of our food companies mixed here together. While technology is less than 1% of the index. So that's how little it is. And it is one of the sectors that has done phenomenally well. But because it's such a small weight in the index, you don't see that kind of performance as you see in NASDAQ or S&P. But that does not mean that the value is not there. It is some of these stocks have returned almost 100% already uh, in the tech sector. Uh, similarly, healthcare, which is almost 5%, is doing phenomenally well again in Pakistan. So, so don't go on the overall index itself. Uh, sometimes there are stocks that are doing phenomenally much greater than what the index is representing. So just to give you an idea, on the next slide, what we've done here is taken the some of the biggest companies of the stock market and plotted them against the index itself since March 25th. So on March 25th, the index touched a low of 27,000 points and has recovered almost 25% since then. But if you look at some of the companies and I've highlighted them by color coded by different sectors. So you'll see a lot of uh, material companies, which is probably cement, steel companies doing a lot better. Uh, again, the reason for doing a lot better is because there was a sharp reduction in interest rates. So these companies did much better because they were highly levered. Uh, so they required that stimulus. And again, tech companies, so TRG did a 100% return systems, another tech company, 60% return. So these are some of the names on the tech side that have done phenomenally well along with cements. While you look at traditionally what the index biggest heavyweights for banks, so all the banks are here. So UBL, Mizan, Al Habib, Habib Bank, HBL are all in terms of performance have only done negative 10 to plus 10%. So it's not the index is being dragged down by the financial sector, while it's this sector, the cements, the steels, the tech companies that have done phenomenally well. Uh, so that's how the breakup here, here is. So just to give you an idea of what's happening here. So, so without further ado, I'll try to give you some picks here. So what we did was we selected the top three picks that one might want to look at in Pakistan. So obviously number one is Systems Limited, a tech company, probably the, now the, one of the biggest tech companies in Pakistan, especially in this environment. I think it makes sense uh, because uh, a lot of companies are opting for digitization. Uh, systems is already there. The other element that benefits Systems is that most of its revenue comes from dollar returns, right? So a lot of contracts in the Western world. So again, hedged in uh, terms of any depreciation of the rupee, they're hedged, their revenues are hedged. Uh, they provide IT solutions, they provide DPO services. Uh, work from home and done extremely well for them. And the other catalyst that is coming for them is one load. So in India, you have uh, Paytem, you have a lot of tech solutions, you have a lot of uh, uh, FinTech solutions, right? So one load is a solution that, you know, a state bank has recently adopted uh, so we feel that one load can potentially be the, the financial solution to integrate a lot of banking apps, integrate a lot of retail shops into one platform that will allow digital payments. So that's one avenue that systems has other tech companies don't have in Pakistan right now. So as per the management, we feel that one load's valuation itself in the next three years will be equal to the current valuation of the whole company. That's the potential, the potential of one load itself. Right now, the stock is trading at about 150, 160 rupees. Uh, it's rallied from a low of 90 rupees last month. We feel that 250 rupees is not even, uh, it's a safe conservative estimate of its fair price right now. That's an upside of 70%. So even for a long-term investor, I think it will probably go uh, even beyond 250. So this is a one great pick uh, for Pakistan. Pick number two is the power sector, Hub Power Company, which is one of the bigger 
power generation companies in Pakistan. They've gone through a lot of expansion phase right now. So that's why we're looking into this because not only is it a dividend paying stock, which it was historically, it's become a growth stock right now. Uh, earnings are growing phenomenally well. We expect dividends to continue after two, a gap of two years because they'll be going through that expansion phase and their earnings are insulated, I would say, or slightly immune because uh, we are constantly, these companies are in Pakistan are on an IPP model, which are guaranteed payments. So they have a fixed IRR, which is the rate of return guaranteed to these companies. Uh, it's dollarized also. The rupee depreciation will also benefit them uh, because more new PKR is linked to the dollar value. So we can expect this company, which is trading at about 70 rupees right now, expected to touch about 125, 130 rupees in the current 12 months, uh, giving an upside yield of 62%. Yeah, and along with the but on the stock, of course, there's a big controversy that there is a inquiry pending with all IPPs, contracts, and so on and so forth. We, however, have taken a view that I don't think, I mean, even if there is an election, it won't be that significant. Even if there is some revision in their uh, contracts, it may be subsequent. Uh, I, I don't see an ups uh, adjustment into the IRR contracts that the government have already signed in. Even if there is a voluntary, uh, it will be very, uh, it, it, it will be fairly nominal. So keeping that in mind, I think the valuation, the upside that uh, is highlighting is quite significant. Uh, Khaldun and you just uh, time check. Uh, we almost at the top of the hour, 10, 10 minutes left. So I think uh, you want to move into the QA session. Okay. So I'll just give you our last slide here. Uh, third company that we selected is Lucky Cement. I think it's, it's, it's the biggest cement company in Pakistan and is diversified because it's in the cement space, auto space, chemical, and the power space, right? And because of the domestic demand story in Pakistan, I think this is ideally positioned to take a benefit of all the factors, all the stimulus the government is doing right now. So these are our top three picks. And uh, now we'll open the floor to any Q&A. So uh, there was a question from Sharia Chokhtai and uh, he requested that he just, instead of typing the long question, he would uh, uh, unmute and ask the question. So, uh, Shariat, please go ahead. Sure, thank you. A um, couple of questions I wanted to ask. One from the overseas investors' perspective, one from the local ones. Um, from overseas investors' perspective, I think 80-90% of the people invest in real estate. The key problem with that asset class is that you simply can't take your money out because you need all that state bank approvals and all. So, if you can please explain this SCRA, the Special Invertible Rupee Account Mechanism, where you can invest and at least take your money back to the US or Singapore or wherever you are. That's number one. Yeah. Number two is about new product development. So the best performing fund that I've seen uh, in, in the past six months, 12 months is the Mizan Gold Fund. So do you plan to launch a gold or a commodity fund, number one? Number two, local domestic investors don't have access to all the international markets. So do you plan to, or is there a regulatory requirement that you can open a developed market funds, which fund, mutual fund, which can track the S&P? So somebody sitting in Lahore or Multan can you know, invest in your fund or I think Laxon Investments has a developed market fund. I'm not sure how, how it's performing. So, so these two questions, one from the local and one from the international investors perspective. Yep. Thank you, Sharyar. Yeah, okay. First is uh, SCRA. So the special uh, convertible rupee account is, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy process, but there is a number of banks offering that facility, including Tessel, uh, I think, uh, uh, UBL, uh, so Standard Chartered, Citibank, all of these banks have uh, op options. Uh, there's an account opening pro procedure through which you can open an SERA account. The SERA account stands for Special Convertible Rupee Account, which effectively means that any money that comes into the, inv uh, any investment that comes through this channel will be, can be repatriated at T plus two without any involvement of central bank. So it's a very smooth channel for moving money in and out. So as far as, however, this channel is only for securitized assets. So it cannot be used for foreign direct investments. It cannot be used for real estate or for any non-securitized asset class. So anything that is say treasury bills, PIBs, uh, stock exchange, any of these, even debt for that matter, uh, TFCs, listed TFCs, all can be accessed through the special uh, SERA account. 
So it's a it's an ease that the central bank has offered for foreigners, including uh, expat Pakistanis. So uh, I mean, if you want, we'll be happy to give you some introductions in terms of who would whoever would want to make investments through this channel. Uh, it's a it's a slightly lengthy process. It takes about about three to four weeks in terms of uh, uh, running these operations. If it's an individual, it's shorter. If it's a corporate, it's a slightly lengthier process because then you have to notarize all your documents from the respective embassies in your jurisdictions. So that's a slightly lengthier and cumbersome process. But it's uh, the channel is available. Uh, the other question you uh, raised was with regards to um, uh, for the so commodity for the funds and developed market funds for the local investors. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we don't have any intentions of launching. I mean, I, I agree with you. Gold has performed tremendously well, partially because gold as an asset class has done well globally, but also a currency weaknesses is captured within a gold fund. Uh, the problem with the gold fund is we've looked at the, the PMX. Uh, I mean, we've, we've looked at some of those. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of investor appetite. Domestically, most of the institutions cannot participate into this fund. It's mostly individuals and individuals prefer holding on to physical gold as opposed to contractual gold. And then the problem with contractual gold is that the rollover of each of these contracts is is a, is, a, is an is contribution to the expense ratio of these funds. So if you look at the performance of the fund that you've highlighted, if you look at its track record over the last 10, 15 years, it, this is the only year, perhaps two years, where it has performed, uh, where, it has, uh, where it has outperformed. So it is, and, and I'm not saying most of these uh, products are, you know, have different cycles where their performance is. It's a great avenue of investment, but as of right now, Fessel is not looking into entering into the commodity space. Uh, we have just repositioned ourselves, so perhaps at a later stage, but right now, we won't be entering in this uh, space. Uh, but it is an opportunity. Uh, I think it has done it, and as long as uncertainty is there, I think gold as an asset class will continue to perform. Uh, but we feel that bulk of the uncertainty is behind us. I think we're closer to reaching the 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 of the the tail end of this uh, cycle. So I think this will be a time to be looking towards an exit from these funds as opposed to making fresh investments into these funds. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, we've had uh, and of course, of course, it's a great diversifier. I, I must say, it's a great diversifier. So anyone who has a portfolio, a, a small proportion can be invested in this. It offers a great hedge both in terms of currency and in terms of potential returns. But we, as an institution, uh, right now, we don't have any such plans in terms of entering this space. Uh, the third point awesome. uh, you asked was with regards to local investors investing into S&P and global uh, equities. Unfortunately, we as an asset manager, uh, we have some capital controls uh, implemented. So we can only repatriate less than 15% of our AUMs or uh, $15 million, whichever one is lower. So as a consequence, I mean, the amount of, uh, if, if $15 million is, is what I have to invest in global markets to develop the expertise, the cost benefit analysis for any asset manager, not just myself, but for anyone else doesn't really make sense. Because if I am to invest anyone's money into a market, I would want to fully understand it. I need to have the necessary research and capability of accessing it and participating it. Or for a $15 million ticket, uh, really the return doesn't make sense. So frankly, not, which is why uh, Laxon had a fund uh, which was predominantly being driven by their own uh, for their own capital, but it hasn't been uh, uh, something that they have progressive uh, that has grown significantly in terms of domestic appetite. Okay, so a couple so, of quick. I think those questions. are the challenges on the front. Uh, so Khaldun, the, like there, there are a few questions on on the chat. Uh, one is uh, that Pakistan stock exchange has it seen the lowest, or uh, with, uh, like with this all this COVID going on, uh, we should still expect something like it, it going down. Uh, look, uh, uh, I mean, COVID is an uncharted territory. Frankly, it, it's my guess versus anybody else's guess as to what COVID will do. My general sense is over the last three months, the data that has come out of COVID, uh, there is this general sense of optimism that there is some level of immunity within South Asia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. Uh, we haven't seen the deaths as the rest of the developed world. And that unfortunately has made us lazy. And uh, over Eid in particular, then you had that uh, the last 10 days of Ramzan where you had that massive rally uh, uh, from the Shiite community. Uh, I think all of that is going to contribute to a big outburst of COVID post Eid. And over the next 10, 15 days, I think the data will start to expand very quickly. So like uh, some of the simulations that I've seen from uh, World Health Organization, I think we're now on a path where there'll be a rapid rise in COVID uh, patients in Pakistan we may have very high fatalities relatively quickly, uh, and then there'll be a sudden fall as well. So I think over the next 60 days, 
uh, I think the worst of COVID is going to come in the forefront as far as Pakistan is concerned. But uh, how is that going to affect the stock exchange? Like, is it going to like so uh, right? Like I like like I said, right now, all investors, Pakistan as a community, is in this false. Uh, I, I think it's, it, it, it has accepted the fact that we have some level of immunity and it is somewhat ignoring the data that is coming out from that sense. However, I think in the next 10, 15 days, if there is an explosion of patients, perhaps it will come back into the forefront. Right now, if you look at the market's performance, everyone is ignoring the data. And to be honest, it's my guess versus yours. Maybe there is a true immunity okay. and this data doesn't become ugly. And frankly, the worst is behind us. Uh, Perfect. Chances are that the worst is behind us, but we'll have to see the next 15, 20 days. Okay. There's one more question. FATF, like once, if we get off the list, how is it going to impact uh, the stock change? Or if we don't get off, what's going to happen? Uh, I, I think FATF has somewhat lost its, uh, I mean, right now after COVID, uh, this is something that's running in the background. Uh, I, I mean, as far as our regulators are concerned, I think there's a lot of effort being happening as we speak. Uh, I don't think they have, taken the pedal off the accelerator, including we are a regulated entity. So as a result, we have a lot of communication back and forth from the regulator as on this account. So while we have some extensions from the FATF in terms of implementing our, port, uh, uh, our FATF uh, program, uh, and I think it was a much needed breathing space, but as far as the regulators concern is continuing, continuing with, its, with, it, with its efforts. So I, I, I do feel that we may just get off, but right now, while at one point it seemed like it will be a stimulus for the market because it was a key ingredient as far as foreign institutional investment was concerned. Right now, because foreigners are exiting globally from uh, emerging slash frontier markets, I, I think it may not turn out to be such a strong catalyst as it was once perceived. Uh, while it will be favorably viewed, it won't result into immediate dividends. Uh, that's That will be my expectations. Got it. Uh, so uh, as far as Starts investing in. Is there any cash flow restrictions like min max kind of a thing? Like they, we, uh, start should be aware of. Uh, there, is, there are no restrictions, so to speak. Of course, I mean uh, the only uh, for any investor. I think financial institutions may, if you have investment beyond five percent of capital, paid up capital, there is a disclosure requirements. As far as investment is concerned, there are no restrictions. There are just disclosure requirements beyond certain levels. Other than that, there are no restrictions for any uh, foreign investment. All right. So, is there the uh, is the data like uh, investment data shared with uh, let's say IRS if, if a US citizen invests with Tesla? Yeah, yeah, we are also. Uh, I mean, we we will be reporting our fat cards to the US uh, regulators. It will go to. I mean, we, there's a whole process now. This is implemented. So, frankly, all the investment that will come through, if uh, someone has disclosed their uh, US citizenship, we will be disclosing their investments to the US regulators. Perfect. Uh, you mentioned the top three picks. Uh, but the question is that what's the time of uh, timing of entry? Like, is it now? Is it a month from now? I, I would like, from my personal expectations, like I said, I think the data uh, which we have been ignoring may just explode in the next 10 to 15 days. We also have budget coming out on the 12th of June. I think these are two points that I would wait off till say the 15th of June with these two specific, specifically. You see right now my argument of investment is we are still trading at the lower end of the price to earning band. So if I am targeting for it to revert back to nine times, I don't see that happening in three months. I don't see that happening in 12 months. I think it's okay. a 16 to 18 month exercise. If I have that kind of view, I can be patient enough to wait for these two events, have some level of clarity, and then truncate my investment and spread it over the next three months. Don't invest in one go. Uh, if I have a hundred bucks, I'm not going to invest all hundred bucks in, in a day. I will spread it over. I don't know where the bottoms are, but personally, I think it's less likely that we will go back to 27,000. I think right now, 30,000 seems to be the near term bottom. Uh, if I get an opportunity around those levels, I think it will be a great opportunity. Uh, but to be fair, I am not looking at the upside of 45,000. Even if I'm investing today, I'm looking for the market to go to 55 or 60,000 mark. Uh, index level. Otherwise, frankly, the return risk reward won't make sense. And I think once, because if the way the index calculates itself, every year, 3,000, every quarter, about 3,000 points are added on to the base just from the dividends itself. So frankly, for, for the high of the index, which is 52,000 points, 
right now if i want all the stocks to go back to that price the index will be close to 65000 so frankly i think there's a lot of upside room right now i won't be uh, you know i i would be aiming to be patient for those kind of returns which will kick in over the next 12 to 18 months and i think that's what one should be aiming for not for where the bottom is the 2 3000 points here and there Got it. Uh, there's one more question uh, about uh, like uh, prior to this COVID happening, there was always like already talks around uh, a global recession coming in. Is it going to be a compounded effect? Like, is it uh, does it have its own life cycle? How how do you see that? Uh, of course, look, a global recession does affect uh, the whole world. But to be honest, Pakistan is not a country driven by exports. So while it will be affected, I'm not. Uh, it will be less affected than its peer countries. So which is why, if tomorrow, let's say my view is there is a global recession subsequent to COVID, there will be like, like I say that okay, fine, COVID. There will be a solution to COVID, but the world will stay in a recession for a protracted period. Then the postulation okay. is the rest of the world will struggle more while Pakistan will struggle less because it is more driven by domestic demand. Uh, challenges, of course, will be how it will manage its external imbalances. So as long as it can achieve external imbalances, remain uh, you know, on the external front, uh, chances are we will outperform the global markets. Awesome. So uh, there, there are two questions around how to actually get started with us if you are outside of you, uh, Pakistan or if you are local to Pakistan. So uh, I think it would be great if uh, later to this, if you can share some information on how to get engaged. Sure, and sure. Uh, um, I, I think that's uh, pretty much it. We are uh, at the top of our uh, great session. Thank you, Khaldun. Thank you, Ayub. Thank and you. Uh, any last words, uh, like um, any uh, parting words, please. Yep. Look, we will share our email addresses tomorrow. Anyone from your group would have any queries in, or any ideas that they want to run through us in terms of uh, revalidating them. We'll be more than happy to assisting anyone. Uh, you know, our desire would be to help any of our expat Pakistanis trying to understand and looking for opportunities here. We'll be more than happy to individually help them find the right opportunities for them, which is a careful balance of uh, the risk that they may be undertaking. So I will awesome. leave you guys with our email addresses. If there is any query, please uh, feel free to let us know. Thank you so much. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, they can reach out to Ali Sa uh, Saad or anybody else, and uh, we can uh, put you through with the uh, Khaldun and Ayub. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an excellent Thank pleasure. you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.